Hello everyone. Will Seoul become the new art capital of Asia? That's still a hot debate. And now that Freeze has wrapped up its first art fair in the city and continent, there are clearer signs on whether this art boom in South Korea will stick around. For the first time, Freeze moved beyond its traditional venues of London, New York and Los Angeles to put on a show in Seoul. And it seems that was a good idea, with organizers, gallerists and collectors alike satisfied with the result. According to reports, the four-day event attracted over 70,000 visitors and substantial sales across more than 100 booths. The selection included works by big names such as Picasso and Andy Warhol, as well as emerging artists from the region. Concurrently, the same venue also held the annual Korea International Art Fair, which enjoyed a similar outcome. This is all great news for the city, as it's part of a bigger plan to make the vibrant South Korean capital the region's next art hub. I think Free Seoul coming to Korea is really more a validation of the strength of, of the market, of the infrastructure, of the cultural scene. I think uh, to have an international fair of this capacity and um, of this professionalism to arrive here in, in Korea is definitely a plus for the area. It's a complement to the area, but it's also a result of what Seoul has become. Well, watch out Hong Kong because the region has another big player now. What makes Seoul stand out is that compared to China, South Korea is considered more financially and politically stable. Though for the head of Tadeusz Ropak Gallery, it's misguided to act as if Asia can't support two legitimate art market hubs. Quarantine restrictions still imposed on visitors may have also played a part in Hong Kong losing its charm. Whereas Seoul's art market exploded at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, during which online viewing and young collectors soared. You have very established collectors who collect art for 30 years or 40 years, and you see the result, which I think is quite astonishing. But then you also feel a very fresh new approach to art, um, which is not entirely carried by knowledge and uh, which has also a very spontaneous approach to art. And I think both together create a movement which I think is, in my view, very welcome. The country's president, Yoon Sok Yol, is on board too. Back in July, he ordered an almost $4 billion investment in the arts to make the country even more culturally attractive. So the South Korean wave looks set to rise. And for the mayor of Seoul, it makes perfect sense. He recently said, there has been K-drama and K-pop, so why not K-fine art? Multimedia Van Gogh shows are nothing new. Many exhibits offer an in-depth look at the works by the Dutch painter. But now Brazil is hosting a new one set to be the best version ever made. But why are immersive shows so popular in the first place? Take a look. The 360 degree digital projections reflect modern paintings by Vincent van Gogh. Walls, floors and all other surfaces are covered with works by the Dutch artist. Although it might feel a little dizzying for some, Van Gogh Live 8K is a popular attraction for people in Rio de Janeiro. Organizers of the show say the paintings are in a very high-definition format called 8K, which refers to an image or video with a width of approximately 8,000 pixels. It took us a team of 50 people and six months to develop this project. And we mixed different themes to deconstruct Van Gogh's work. And the lineup was even more interesting with instrumental music by The Beatles, Pink Floyd, Vivaldi, and Beethoven. Van Gogh Live, Beyond Van Gogh, or Immersive Van Gogh, 
Names and production companies may vary, but the concept of the shows remain the same. They all chase the same idea, which is to bring Van Gogh's works alive. Many production companies agree that this multimedia experience format is more adaptable than most other forms of entertainment. Shows often require venues such as warehouses or convention centers. Plus, it makes major artworks more accessible for people anywhere in the world. These programs can also take social distancing into account. And visiting hours are more flexible than museums. And although some immersive exhibits have featured Monet and Frida Kahlo's works, Van Gogh still remains the most popular. But why? Svetlana Dvorotsky from Show One Productions told the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation that it's simply because Van Gogh is in the public domain and that the images are largely free to use for these shows. And for Matthew Santa Arnaud, the creative director of Beyond Van Gogh, people know the artist and his works are within reach. It's fascinating to see a painting in motion. I think that's the most amazing part. Because, first of all, we are in an era of interactivity. So video speaks volumes, and transforming paintings into video is fantastic. Organizers say Van Gogh Live 8K has broken a record in Brazil with 40,000 people per purchasing tickets. And after this stop, the exhibition will travel to South Africa, Europe and the United States in hopes of giving people a deeper insight into Van Gogh's work and life. After almost 10 years, Brazil's Polista Museum has reopened and for a nation marking two centuries of independence from colonialism, it means a lot more than just the return of an art space. Brazilians did everything in their power to ensure the Paulista Museum returned just in time for Independence Day celebrations. After all, it's the country's bicentennial. The museum in Sao Paulo holds more than 3,000 art pieces, 2,800 of which were restored since its closure in 2013. The restoration has reportedly cost $40 million, a sum that also includes a facelift of the building's facade. The building itself is significant because it was established in 1895 by the creek where Emperor Pedro I declared independence from Portugal. The museum actually did not start as a museum. It was born as a monument to independence, and now with the independence bicentennial, it is at its peak visibility, where we can discuss our identity and history through this building and exhibitions. And that history is visible in the museum's centerpiece. Pedro Americo's 1888 painting, Independence of Death. This art highlights a very important moment for us when we became independent. We cannot deny that it represents the moment we separated ourselves as a colony to become an independent nation. The return of the Paulista is said to be celebrated in classic Brazilian festive fashion with authorities expecting a million visitors until the end of 2022. U.S. investigators have returned 16 antiquities valued over $4 million to Egypt. A portion of the artifacts were seized earlier this year at the Met Museum. And more than half of them were recovered during an investigation into one of the world's biggest ancient art collectors, Michael Steinhardt. After two muted editions during the COVID-19 pandemic, the 47th Toronto International Film Festival is back. The lineup includes much anticipated titles from Steven Spielberg to Ryan Johnson. This event has a different buzz as it relies on the moviegoers to choose the best film. And their choice usually gets to be nominated for the best picture at the Oscars. Netflix has released the fifth season of its Karate Kid spin-off, Cobra Kai. The series has attracted audiences to its 80s nostalgia and themes of mentorship, family and support. 
and the cast says viewers can expect more emotion and violence as the stakes get even higher in the new season. And Netflix has remade the 1930 Oscar-winning film All Quiet on the Western Front. This is the third adaptation of Eric Mario Remarque's masterpiece. It also marks the first time the lead characters speak German. The 147-minute film will premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival and is set for an end-of-October release on Netflix. Maison Artsy doesn't care what social media influencers are wearing. Instead, he's into sustainability and Africa's heritage. Now, he tells Esra about how he's taken his vision to the Victorian Albert Museum. Artsy Ifrak, also known as Maison Artsy, was born in Jerusalem. He lived in Tel Aviv, Paris and Amsterdam. Then, he wanted to chase the roots of his family, so he made it to Marrakesh, which he calls the city of his heart. And all of his designs are inspired by the place and the entire continent. He creates one-of-a-kind pieces made of vintage fabrics. His approach is exactly the opposite of fast fashion, and he turns every piece into an artsy photograph. Now, one of his works is on display at the Victoria and Albert Museum as a part of an Africa fashion exhibit. Over an email exchange he wrote, African fashion means everything to him. There is no fashion in Africa, there is culture that evolution-wise become fashion and inspire many designers all over the world. But this was a, a place that culture became so profound and so strong and we had to dress ourselves with beautiful garment and beautiful artisan. And Ifrak is only one of the 45 designers whose works are on display at the show. The new exhibition tells the history of the continent's fashion. It also puts on display more than 250 items by mid-20th century and contemporary designers. It's the first time that the V&A brings so many pieces related to African fashion together. And for the curator, timing is just right for the show, because we see it's the African creatives that are shifting the landscape of global fashions. That's how important their impact is right now. So they demand to be seen, they demand to be heard, and we see their impact spilling out across global fashions. Chikinska adds, in the past, African creativity had been excluded or misrepresented in the museum. And that, this exhibit is a part of the V&A's commitment to highlight the work by Africans. And she says, those creatives are changing the shape of fashion. And for designer Artsy Ifrag, fashion must transform from a space for commercial opportunism to an outlet for memories and heritage. Stephanie Crowchild is an indigenous fashion designer from Canada and she's set to make her debut at the Rise New York Fashion Week this Friday. look to my ancestors, my, you know, great-grandmothers, my grandfather, and, and just replicating their teachings, their culture, and, you know, with all of the adversities that we actually had to face and still face today, um, just really overcoming that, and I really love to showcase it through my designs. Uh, this one is actually my, my personal piece, um, Hudson's Bay coat, and then these just kind of resemble like the capote style that my late grandfather wore. Um, here we have a pocket, and then I use this uh, imitation L2 that is like a button.
being here, you know, and, and showcasing is, is a dream come true. I think my next steps as a designer is just seeking a lot of, I guess, gaining, you know, more support and more exposure for myself and, and gaining connections. It took long time friends Julia Roberts and George Clooney around five years to make another movie together. But this time they have ditched the crime genre for a romantic comedy. I'm sorry, I think your things are in my seat. Oh. Sorry. In Ticket to Paradise, Julia Roberts and George Clooney play a divorced couple who team up against their daughter. Once they bump into each other on their way to her wedding, the two make a pact to stop their daughter from making the same mistake they made 25 years ago. And in real life, Clooney and Roberts go way back too. They co-starred in multiple flicks together including the heist comedy movies of the Oceans franchise and the 2016 crime drama Money Monster. Just keep talking to him, all right? You're good at that. Got my finger on the trigger. As much as this will pain But Clooney says following the COVID-19 pandemic, it was a relief to film a romantic comedy. Did you make a pact to not murder each other until you murder me first? We enjoyed it because we got to be snarky with each other. We thought that was funny. We also thought it was kind of a nice time to do something light kind of all been through it a little bit, all of us together as a, as a human race, and so we thought it'd be fun. Promise, no mean comments. Well, it's a good thing Clooney and Roberts agreed to do the film. Director and co-writer Al Parker admits he would have gotten pretty pushy if they had rejected him. There was no plan B. If they'd said no, I'd still be writing to them now, going, I'm sorry, I don't think you quite understand you are doing this film. So um, luckily they said yes first go, but otherwise I really would. I'd still be at my desk going, there seems to be a misunderstanding. This is your film. And they had the most fun with these scenes, probably because they didn't have a choreographer. But was that really a good idea? I'm praying for an asteroid. Could you not tell? <laughs> All was just like... Do what you want, don't hurt each other, and stay in the room. No one can get hurt. Yeah. Just your eyes. <laughs> it was so much fun, though. It, it was, was fun. fun. Yeah, it was fun. It was and fun. we really did humiliate the young actors. <laughs> they literally were going, oh my god. This makes me happy. So what's the plan? Both Clooney and Roberts also admit this script wouldn't have worked for them without each other. And so far, critics seem to agree. Jordan Rumi from World of Real says, the draw of the film is the pair's chemistry, and others have noted it's a charming crowd pleaser, the ultimate new rom com, and even the feel good comedy of the year. You clean up pretty good. Back in the 1950s, most audiences weren't quite ready for a genre movie that talked about gender roles and politics. But Johnny Guitar did just that. And by doing so, it became the first politically charged feminist Western. In our movie Almanac, Ali John explains. Come and get me, Mr. McIvers. We don't want no shooting, Vienna. I'm not coming peaceably, Marshal. Johnny Guitar tells the story of Vienna, a woman who's suspected of a robbery and murder she did not commit and we see her struggle to fight off locals that try to run her out of town. The movie's iconography is pure Western. There's gunplay, a saloon, and the open frontier. But it's the way director Nicholas Ray handles the story that allows him to deconstruct the genre. First, the movie criticizes gender roles in society. Vienna is an independent woman who's not afraid to express her own opinions. For example, she's all for a new railroad, which puts her at odds with some of the town's folk. Johnny Guitar also comments on the actual political climate of 1950s America. Critics say the lynch mob that goes after Vienna is actually a stand-in for McCarthyism, which got many Hollywood figures blacklisted. You'll have to do it yourself, Emma. 
the movie was made in 1954, and according to the likes of Martin Scorsese, at the time, audiences in the U.S. didn't know how to handle a movie that defied the conventions of the Western, the way Johnny Guitar did. It was only after the picture opened in Europe, and the likes of Jean-Luc Godard and François Truffaut praised the movie as a Western dream that Johnny Guitar finally found acceptance. How many men have you forgotten? As many women as you remember. Today, it has cemented its place in cinema history as what critics call a statement that transcends its period setting. And let's face it, that kind of praise is rarely, if at all, is used when talking about Westerns. Johnny Guitar. Disney has remade its famous classic Pinocchio. Some are skeptical about the rendition, but the filmmakers assure fans that their film is not only relevant in this day and age, it's also something fresh. Ladies and gentlemen! Pinocchio is about the adventures of a puppet maker and his marionette who comes alive. We all know this because it's based on the fan-favorite cartoon produced by Walt Disney himself. This time, however, there are changes. The main one is that the animation aesthetic is replaced with a live-action narrative. But still, why remake such a beloved classic? The makers of the movie argue that the story of Pinocchio is still relevant for its universal and timeless themes. Can you imagine the trouble he's gonna get into? Lying and telling the truth, it would be, how about how basic and primal a theme is that? Yeah. You know? How about that? Now, the, the original, Disney's, came out in 1941, and what happened then? Oh, World War II. And here, this is coming out in 2022, in which the whole concept of what is the value of truth and can it be commoditized, or, you know, it, is it something that you can play fast and loose with? I believe you can't and if you can you shouldn't and all right let's 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 go by the, let's examine that by way of uh, you know a, a re reimagined master from Walt Disney himself wouldn't want that on my conscience while the new film can't avoid being compared to the original director Robert Zemeckis assures that their take brings something new to the table first of all <laughs> you know, our movies live action so we've dimensionalized all the key characters. That's a big change. And we've uh, kept the same tone, the same feel of the original movie, but we modernized the storytelling quite a bit and added some new characters and some new songs, but it's very much in the spirit of the original movie. And co-lead Tom Hanks says they've added more human drama to the story. At the end of the day, what can you do playing Pinocchio's dad, you know, Geppetto in his workshop? Well, it turns out there's a number of small things you can do. Part of it is weighing the man's loneliness, among other things. He doesn't really seem like a lonely guy in the original. But in this day and age, I think an old man who, you know, yearns to be a part of a family, uh, there's, some, there's some emotional meat there. Reviews call the movie a magical grand adventure that will please families but say it's not whimsical or macabre enough. Well, maybe that title can go to the other upcoming Pinocchio movie from Guillermo del Toro, a director known for his darker fantasy movie fare. My real boy. That's it for this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. From me and the whole team here in Istanbul, thank you for watching and goodbye for now.